on the next McDougal MD, a life-saving doctor. Is he a quack or a hero? Join us and you be the judge. This is Hello Channel. Can you and your family be poisoned by chemicals in the environment? It's already happening to wildlife from Florida to the Great Lakes to Puget Sound. What's the danger? Our specialists will tell you. Plus, John reveals how to prevent hardening of the arteries. I'm Mary McDonough, and you're watching McDougal MD. Hey, John! <laughs> We're going to have fun. Oh, yes. We I always have fun. I've got some really important things to tell you about. Okay. Something that might be going on, in fact, pro possibly is going on in your body right now, and it's the leading cause of death and disability in all of Western society. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a disease that uh, damages the arteries and eventually closes them down, and it results in all kinds of conditions, and some of them that may really surprise you. We name the disease based upon the artery that gets closed down and the organ affected. Uh -huh. Okay, so say for example, we close down the arteries to the ears. Okay. We call that hearing loss. Uh -huh. We close down the arteries to the head and we call it a stroke. Mm -hmm. We close down the arteries to the heart, mm -hmm. have a heart attack. Close down the arteries to the kidneys, you have kidney failure. The arteries to the back. And you get back pain and you get degenerative disc disease, or in other words, ruptured disc. You know, people that rupture their disc, it's not because they pick up a piano, it's because the discs are degenerated. Mm -hmm. And that's because of low blood supply to the disc. You close the arteries to the legs, and it hurts when you walk. And eventually, the arteries get uh, so so closed that the uh, the feet could die, and you get gangrene. Uh -huh. Now I got one for you. Okay. Close, Tell me. <laughs> close the arteries to the penis, and you become impotent. Oh, okay. It's not. That makes it's sense. It's not because men, as they get older, lose interest in women. It's because of bad blood supply, mm -hmm. and that may be a stronger motivation to change diet than anything else for a lot of people. So this process uh, that closes down the arteries, it's. Um, it's not a natural, normal thing. I mean, it's not part of genetics or getting older, as we've been taught. And the reason we know that is when you look around the world, what you find is there are parts of the world still today where heart disease is virtually unknown, mm -hmm. where people have very few strokes. Yet when these people, say, from Asia that I'm talking about or from Africa, move to the United States and they change the way they live, mm -hmm. and you've heard of some of the things I'm talking about, like the not American getting enough diet. exercise. Yes. I wasn't going to mention that first. <laughs> yeah. Or cigarette smoking. Uh -huh. And certainly when they change their diet, what happens is they start to get this disease. Now, I'm going to tell you some things about it that you may think Now, the official name of the disease? Is atherosclerosis. Okay. Did you get that, everyone? Atherosclerosis. It's very, you know, it's not as hard as hardening of the arteries. <laughs> <laughs> it's atherosclerosis. And uh, it, it, I think it's very important and very interesting to understand how it happens. You've got arteries, which are nice, clean tubes that are, uh, uh, that the blood is, are, is flowing mm -hmm. through. These arteries have a very smooth lining internal lining that we call the intima. It's not important, but internal lining is very smooth. And what happens is that internal lining, it gets injured. It gets injured by uh, products of cigarette smoke combustion. Mm -hmm. It gets injured by antibodies, which are directed towards, say, dairy protein that attack the inside line of the arteries. It gets injured by oxidized fat and oxidized cholesterol. So it injures the inside lining, and now that lining becomes permeable. Oh. Okay, so now cholesterol and fat get under that lining and cause festering sores. Oh. Now, we don't call them festering sores. We call them plaques. If we call them festering sores, people, people. might get scared and do something about it. <laughs> yes, they might start eating differently, they right, might John? Take but you can imagine kind of like you get a sliver of wood stuck in your hand. Uh -huh. You get swelling, redness. So it's uh, different from clogging. Well, I'm going to tell you how the clogging process okay. takes place. This is how it starts. Oh, this you is how the it starts. You get the sores okay. developing. Like if you had a sliver of wood stuck in there, you get uh -huh. swelling, redness, uh, pus would form in there. An infection, in there. maybe. Right. Like, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, with your hand, you've got nerves in your hand, so it tells you that something's in there, like a sliver of wood, so, so you, you pull down. Pull it out. Right. In your arteries, you get slivers of cholesterol and globs of fat stuck in this skin on the inside line of the arteries. You can't feel it. It's a silent disease. It's silent until... The, the last phase when the artery completely closes down. Now, I want to tell you how that happens because if, for you to understand this mechanism, Mary, will make, will make it uh, possible to understand all kinds of important things about the disease. The mechanism that happens is a tiny sore. Now, I want to say that word again, tiny sore, mm -hmm. and we'll call it plaque from now on because we don't want to upset people, but a tiny plaque, it ruptures. And the process of rupturing acts as a catalyst to cause the blood to suddenly clot.
It's not that these sores grow bigger and bigger and bigger and finally close off the artery. That'd be a slow process. You'd have warning time. What happens is suddenly one of these tiny plaques ruptures and causes the blood to clot, which closes off the blood supply. Now, the okay. reason that's important for you to know is it explains why people who are, quote, perfectly healthy drop dead of heart disease. Mm. You know, you, you, you put your spouse to bed at night and you wake up the next morning and you shake him and he's not there. Well, he was perfectly fine when he went to bed last night. Well, he wasn't perfectly fine. He had all these little landmines, these little bombs sitting there ready to go off. Well, how do we heal all the plaques? Okay, that's the important part. Now, if you understand this mechanism, the fact that this ruptures which gets you into trouble, then you can understand how to get out of trouble almost immediately. As soon as you change your diet, what happens is you start to stabilize the plaques because you bathe them with the healthy blood and they're less likely to rupture. Uh, you also stop pushing the fat and cholesterol into the plaques which overstuffs okay. them to make them rupture. That's the first thing you do. Second thing you do is you remove the strongest clotting factor that human beings come in contact with and that's animal fat when you change your diet. Animal fat makes the platelets, which are blood clotting elements, get very sticky. They can hardly wait to mm -hmm. stick together. And there are protein factors in the blood that we call clotting factors that want to spill over into this blood clot to close that artery down. As soon as you take the animal fat out of your diet, the, bl the blood safely and effectively thins. And then in time, you can actually measure the atherosclerosis reversing. How? Well, you do it with... <laughs> How do you do that? Don't you, you want to know? You want to do it in a simple, safe way. You do it by, by doing artery dye studies. That's okay. one way to do it. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see it reverse. But you don't have to wait for the months or years it takes to show that kind of reversal. As soon as you change your diet, you stabilize those plaques so they won't rupture, and you naturally and safely thin the blood. And therefore, you get immediate benefits. Of course, Mary, you can also get immediately back into trouble. If you go back to that if you go back high to fat that way food, of, eating. And of course, we're talking about cheeses and meats and butters and so on, the things right. that are animal fat type So products. it's really the low fat diet? It's a low fat, high plant food diet that people want to do to save those arteries. The same diet that cuts their food bill by 40%. Ah, there you go. <laughs> when we continue, we'll meet a man who knows why the fishing is best downstream from the paper mills. Do you know Hello, my name is Javier. I learned English, so can you. Watch Hello Channel. Our first guest studies the effects of environmental pollution on wildlife, and he's seen some shocking results. Join us in welcoming Dr. Glenn Vandercrack. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Welcome. Vandercrack, good to have you here. Uh, you are a zoologist? I certainly am, yes. And so is, is most of your interest in environmental chemicals based on what's happened to the animals out there? Most of my studies have been focusing on looking at feral populations of mostly Excuse fish, me? wildlife, okay. wild <laughs> populations of fish, birds, turtles and the like, and trying to understand how they're responding these days to the current environmental conditions. You know, I read something in a paper just a, a few weeks ago about how the fish are becoming feminized. There certainly has been a number of reports of feminization of fish. And which, which means what? what? Well, what this means largely is that the fish are either displaying secondary, what we call secondary sexual characteristics. They're behaving far more like females. The males are. The males are. They're becoming like females. Or they're producing female-like proteins in their blood, which is um, certainly a shock and a surprise to myself and many of the other scientists who have gone out and observed these. And how common is this? It's unfortunately, it's far more common than one would hope for and it certainly is turning out to be a response that's being seen on a global scale. And what causes this? Well, that's the, that's the million dollar question. Yeah. It's not what causes it. Unfortunately, it seems more often now that we're asking the question, what doesn't Hmm. cause this and that but, but this is natural I mean f this, this is a change that's how why you see it well it it may it may well be natural in the sense that it's the same scope of of responses that one more normally see but it's not frequent that you would see fish producing female male fish producing male, male fish producing mm -hmm. um, female proteins there's a number of responses in um, gastropods, marine snails, where rather than feminization, there's masculinization. Mm. And parts of their reproductive tract and the females have 
male parts in them that's rendering those this, unable to reproduce. This must not be good for future generations of fish and, and snails. Well, it certainly is not, and the difficulty or the, the other big question is that many of the systems that are controlling reproduction in wildlife have been conserved, and the question is, will some of those effects be manifest in you or I, or mm. more importantly, I think, in our children? Well, mm. before, we, I, I, I didn't get an adequate enough answer as to what causes it. You must have some oh, of what causes it. We certainly do. I mean, there's got to be some change out there. There's, there's, a number of, there's a number of chemicals in the environment that are causing these kinds of responses, and many of them are the bad actors that we've recognized for many, many years. Familiar names? DDT and its metabolites. DDE. DDE in particular, some of the um, PCBs and their metabolites, dioxins, mm. and the like. And so, I mean, these are actors, some of which have been banned, at least in North America, for many years, but are still found in increased amounts these days for a variety of reasons. One, because many of these chemicals are recycled. Mm -hmm. Number two, many of them are transported um, through the, the wind, through um, water, water vapor. And so the activities that are going on in Mexico and in South America and Southeast Asia are problems on a global scale because of the transboundary transport of these chemicals essentially across the world. Hmm. They're still using these in Mexico where we get our fruits and vegetables. They're certainly being used there and they're being used in places in South America. And part of the difficulty is, is that some of those chemicals that were introduced you know, 20 and 30 years ago were very, very effective at what they were designed to do. And they're still being used in parts of the developing world. But we in North America and Europe and essentially throughout the globe are being you know, affected by them or at least certainly being exposed to them. And what should I be worried about the most? What as should far you, as the chemical poisoning and what, what you know. I think, I think what you should be worried about the most is in fact, what we, are, we are exposed every day in our diet to a variety of chemicals, some of which could function to alter the functioning of the endocrine system which controls growth, reproduction, development. Breast cancer. Breast cancer, it might be one, prostate may be another. Mm. The issue is, is we may be being exposed to chemicals that we're unaware of that have that potential mm. to cause those types of responses. And it's a question then of identifying what are the actors and at the same time establishing if and how they exert their biological responses or effects. And so it's in some ways a bit like shooting in the dark mm, in terms of really trying know. to identify what are the causative agents. Now certainly we've made some major progress in that regard and we've done uh, vast steps in trying to alleviate some of the, the chemicals. Well, Are these chemicals also responsible for the decrease in sperm count in men that we've seen over the last 60 years? Well that, that's a, that's a I would, I would rather view that as, as in a different way than you've stated it. You stated it as if it was a fact. Well, well there, there and may not be a research. decrease in sperm count. But I, there have been a lot of studies that have reported it. There certainly have been a number of studies that have reported decreases in sperm counts. Yeah. But there are equal numbers that have shown patterns of, of response that vary across the country for which we really don't have a great explanation. And, and male abnormalities of the genital tract? There certainly are a number of, of... They seem to be increasing. They certainly are increasing in places like Europe, incidences of non-descended testes in young boys and the like. The issue, the issue there becomes one of, it, from my opinion, of, of saying, well, what was the cause of that response. Well, let's declare those chemicals guilty until proven innocent. Oh, that's what we John. And we'll be right back in a minute. And when McDougall McDee continues, we'll meet a scientist who looks at the environmental problems from the human side. So please stay with us. I still think Hello. 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 
Hello. Hello. Hey, Mom. Why don't we all go rollerblading tonight? Give your family everything. Give them your time. Joining us now is a man with the answers to some troubling questions. Dr. Warren Foster, welcome to McDougal, MD. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, but first, I have to ask you about this fishing downstream. Why is it better Oh, from a paper mill? The reason why it's better simply is the fact that in the process of making paper and solubilizing trees, you create a whole new pool of nutrients that you release into the water, and that feeds the entire ecosystem so downstream. Bigger and better. Down yeah, but they have more dioxin in them, don't they? They do, but it's it's you can you can you can move that. That's how you, get them. you can move that. It's sort of like smoking, in the sense that the fish are attracted to living there, yes. and they simply didn't know that the chemicals there could be having effects on their reproductive but, development. You know, I've, I've heard warnings that uh, eat a certain number of fish out of Lake Erie, or oh, used yes. to be, that your risk of cancer has increased so many percentage points. I mean, it, is this true? There's no question about that. And that's the whole purpose of having these fish advisories, because of the consumption, or not the consumption, but the biomagnification of some of these persistent organic chemicals that accumulate in the fats of the fish. So that's, that's part of the dilemma. As the fish grow older, they accumulate these in the fat. And mm. when we consume them, mm. we take those in from what they have eaten. And so that can be a real significant problem. How does your interest differ from Dr. Vandercrank's interest in, in this whole subject of chemical pollutions? Uh, unlike Glenn, my interest is focusing on what an impact environmental chemicals may have on human health. You say that what like a politician that? when you say may. Come on now, don't you believe they do? Well, what may, what, what are they? What, what are I, what? What do I ask Which you the same question? Which ones do you believe are true? About? I want to know that. Well, first off, let's, let's make some distinctions. We know that in certain wildlife populations there are effects, mm -hmm. and that's, that's a concern to us. We know that in, in manufacturing processes where people work in chemical manufacturing, they're being exposed to high concentrations, and we've seen effects there. But are the effects that we see there what we would expect to see in the general human population in which levels of exposure are extremely low? Wouldn't you? We, we don't see it. There is no evidence that I have been able to find in reading the medical literature from the world that shows me that in the general human population there are effects. Well, how about there are, we just talked about. Time. There are effects that are seen in people with high level exposure, such as the Inuit, Eskimos that live in the north, where they have high exposure because of the diet. Their subsistence diet is, is, is feeding on seal and whale blubber. Mm -hmm. Well, how about the, the Michigan children who had a decrease in IQ because of the PCBs? Yeah, they, if they were you go, fed to their mothers. So, I mean, isn't that it? And, and yet, if you go to convinced? North Carolina with a similar type of exposure, mm. and it's totally contradictory. And when you go and do a complete meta-analysis where you take all the studies that have right. been published on the structure on this, on this subject, and you put it together, you find that you have an odds ratio of around one. So that means that if you had high exposure, your probability of having lowered IQ is the same as if you didn't have well, let me exposure. Let me ask you. It sounds so, to me like you're saying the jury's out. I don't exactly. want to be a human guinea pig to find out whether this really is poisonous or not. Wouldn't I be prudent to take every step possible to avoid these chemicals? I mean, how could you argue with that? I, I would not argue with that. What I, steps can I take? And what chemicals would be the best to avoid? OK, two questions. Yeah. I'll field yours first. <laughs> <laughs> um, the bad actors, the PCBs, the dioxins, the DDE, DDTs, uh, those are the things that we do know that are, are a problem. They've been banned in North America. They've not been produced here for the past oh, 25 years at the very least. So where least. would I find them the most? Uh, where would you find them the most? Yeah. They would, because of uh, atmospheric transport coming in from, okay. from all over so the there's globe. there's nothing I can do. They're going to be in <laughs> no, the fat. No. <laughs> they're going to be in the fat. They're, they're fat-loving compounds, so they go into the fat. I love a steak. I'm not going to give up my steak, but I'm going to eat well, so I cut the fat off my steak. But there's fat in the, in the marbled in the meat. I minimize my exposure. No, to I'm minimize still... your exposure, you p trade it for a potato. <laughs> Don't That's you minimizing your exposure. Potato. But there are other chemicals present in the potato. Rice. Corn. I can eat rice. We're cutting no, John's diet true? right I, 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 really want, I, really, I do want to address this. Isn't it true that the lower you eat on the food chain, the safer you're going to be as far as chemicals? True. So people should eat as low as possible on the food chain, don't you think? Should they eat organic? I don't know that you're going to have any improvement. If I thought that there was an improvement in doing that. 
but wouldn't I it be safe to err on the side of it? No one agree. can say eating I, chemicals is I good agree. for you. I agree. Okay, so what if, else? If, low if on you would like to do that, if you feel there's a concern, John, yeah. eat low on the food chain. Oh, I do. Okay, now uh, we're getting a little off purpose know, here, don't we? I want we? some practical <laughs> information on how yeah. else we can lower our exposures. Because nobody can say so. it's good to eat chemicals. No, it's not. The problem is, is how do you avoid That's it? That's what I want to know. We've got two of them out. Low on the food chain, buy organic. Is there anything Cut else? off the fat. Cut it to fat. If well, you eat a low else? fat diet, even avocados and things like low that. Low right? fat diet, I low would, fat I would diet. strongly suggest. Because they're sucked up and concentrating mm -hmm. those chemicals. If you're it. going to cook, yeah. mm -hmm. cook in corningware. Don't cook in plastic. Mm. How many oh, people really? microwave in, 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 in say, uh, a margarine container? See, that's you have no idea oh, that's of, of what is going has been it. in that thing and is right. coming out when you microwave so it. It wasn't designed for that purpose, so don't use it for that. Or in glass. Use glass. Oh, that's great. These are the kind We're of practical have, things that we this is what, Yeah, when we'll be back with more of these practical tips. Don't go anywhere. Looking for a brighter future? Learn English and make it happen on Hello Channel. And welcome back. We have Dr. Foster, Dr. Vander Crank, and uh, the subject is environmental chemicals. Uh, last, uh, well, just a few weeks ago, they had an article about Michael J. Fox and him suffering from Parkinson's disease. And about the same time, they had an article in The Lancet that said there was an association between pesticides and Parkinson's. Do you folks have any comment on that possibility? I think it's a reasonable hypothesis. and. and the evidence there is weak at this point in time, but it's an hypothesis that needs to be tested. And until it is tested, we really can't say one way or the other. But it does but need it, more but research. But it does need to be done. So we have a lot of different uh, problems. We have hormone-related problems. We have cancer problems. We have Parkinson's, other damages to the nervous system. I mean, how high does the level of evidence have to get before stronger stands are taken on pesticides? I think part of the answer to that is trying to make the association. The difficulty is is that there's so many different kinds of factors that can affect all of those basic biochemical processes. And we could sp spend a great amount of time and effort and money in going after pesticides, for example. But the issue is, if we're wrong in making those associations, we may have spent our money well, Not I know wisely. I'm going to spend my time avoiding him. Well, thank you very much for being here. Join us next show. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Very informative. There's so thank much you. information. Yep. You know? Good to have you on the show. Yeah.